Order members, the sitting is resumed and it's now time for questions to the Minister of Social Development. And we will begin with 15 minutes of topical questions. And I call David McElveen. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, I'd like to ask the Minister for an update on the Affordable Warmth Pilot Scheme, please. I call the Minister for Social Development. Um, thank the member for, for the question. The Warm Home Scheme itself is our main fuel poverty scheme, and that's really targeted at privately owned and privately rented low-income households. Um, to improve just the energy efficiency of the homes and in that way tackle uh, the, the issue of fuel poverty. Um, the initial target was that we would uh, install energy efficient improvements in 9,000 homes and we've been meeting the target continually year on year since 2009. Um, the Warm Homes Scheme uh, contract is due to end in, in June of next year, uh, so I've asked officials to review the scheme. Um, to see how we're tackling fuel poverty and taking into account the current research that uh, showed that over 33,000 households need to spend more than a quarter of their household income uh, on heating their homes. So we recently completed an achievable affordable warmth area based pilot. That was done in partnership with OFM DFM, with DARD, um, with the University of Ulster, the Housing Executive and 19 of the 26 local authorities. And that, uh, the, the aim of this particular approach was really to uh, deliver energy efficient improvements for homes in small concentrated areas of fuel poverty, to identify areas of poor housing and low income where you have that high prevalence. Um, the university evaluation of the pilot estimates that one in two of the houses contacted actually proved eligible for assistance from the Warm Homes Scheme. Um, a lot of this work was done in cooperation with Professor Christine Liddell from the University of Ulster, and it has directed us in that direction of area-based work, which seems to be much more productive in comparison with how things were being done uh, previously. Um, so from the initial positive results, we have now moved on to phase two uh, of the pilot, um, which is to test energy efficiency measures can be delivered using local installers to carry out the work. So this is encouraging. We will move on to phase two, and um, it is a, a good way, I believe, of, of tackling fuel poverty. I call David McElveen for a supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I, I do thank the Minister for his answer. Um, the Minister will be aware that the Department of Health, through with, in partnership with the Public Health Agency, ran a scheme called um, Keep Warm Packs, which were very low-level, low-tech ways of, of, of tackling fuel poverty as well. I wonder would the Minister see the merit um, in his department considering some sort of a low-tech option um, to help those who are struggling uh, to, to heat their homes this winter? I am aware that in recent years that the Public Health Agency in Northern Ireland have provided, as you say there, uh, some low-income households with keep warm packs, um, and they have been, as, as you indicate there, very popular. I, I believe that the Public Health Agency have been able to identify some funding for around 2,500 to 3,000 keep warm packs for the scheme for this year. So it is a scheme that is very um, much appreciated and, and effective. And I, I certainly welcome that initiative. It is a good example of working in partnership uh, with others to tackle fuel poverty. And we recognise that fuel poverty is a priority. It is a key issue. It needs to be done in a cross-departmental way. Because if you look at the factors that create fuel poverty, they are factors that impact on the work of different departments. I call Jimmy Spratt. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and uh, can I thank the Minister for his answer so far? Uh, can I ask the Minister to confirm uh, when discussions involving the First Minister, the Deputy First Minister, and the Finance Minister uh, on a welfare reform package of migrating measures for Northern Ireland concluded? This has been a major area of work for myself and for the Department over the past year. Um, there were very detailed and lengthy discussions and very intense discussions um, with those at Westminster, with DWP, and um, DFP had a, has an engagement also with the Treasury in that regard. But really, we got to the point there at the end of June where we would had the negotiation with Westminster, we have had the internal discussions with OFM and with DFM, with First Minister and Deputy First Minister, also discussions with the Finance uh, 
ministry as well, finance minister, and you are at a point now where we, we reach there at the, at the end of June, the point where we have put together, I believe, have got a package of measures that will result in, uh, if they were implemented, a much better situation for Northern Ireland than if we were simply to take welfare reform as it is in GB. It addresses the worst aspects of welfare reform while retaining the elements of it that are positive. But that work has now concluded and did conclude at the end of June. Uh, and I call Jimmy Spratt for a supplementary anchor to urge him to try and steer away from the oral question that is listed uh, for later. Mr Spratt. Well, I'll do my best, uh, Deputy Speaker, to uh, not incur your wrath. Uh, uh, but I hope... Uh, uh, can I thank the Minister uh, for the answer that he has given? And uh, does the Minister not agree that there is an urgent need uh, to share with the people of Northern Ireland the details uh, of the package? Uh, which would clearly demonstrate devolution, delivering real and tangible differences uh, to people's lives here within the province, uh, uh, and, and something that has concerned people uh, uh, for quite some period of time. Um, thank you um, for, for the supplementary. I think that the, the point is very well made. By June, we had a position where we have a, a good package of measures and interventions um, to make welfare reform much more suited to the particular circumstances of Northern Ireland. The question now is that there are many people out there who are asking, well, what is this? And in fact, um, I met the other week with um, the, the chair and chief executive from Northern Ireland Council for Voluntary Action, which is the, the, the voice and representative body for the community and voluntary sector in Northern Ireland. And they were keen that we get that information out there uh, into the public domain because there is uncertainty, and that's not good. Um, there are concerns which may well be allayed if people knew what the, the, the package was. Um, and there's also confusion out there because um, as changes are implemented in Great Britain, because of the nature of the uh, technical side of, of delivering welfare benefits, uh, information will come out to people here in Northern Ireland which uh, only applies to GB. We will then have to write out to them and say, by the way, you received such and such a piece of information. That does not apply to you. And so you're actually creating confusion by the delay. And so for, for uh, all those reasons, uh, I think it's important that we get that um, information out as quickly as possible, allaying fears, um, providing assurance for people and avoiding confusion. I call John McAllister. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, continuing on on welfare reform, and I will bear the Deputy Speaker's advice in mind. Uh, the Minister's colleague, Minister Hamilton, yesterday stated that the cost to the Treasury um, in a letter would, would, was currently running at five to six million per month, and then that could, um, by not legislating, that could quickly go to 50 to 60 million by not legislating for this by January. Is the Minister uh, in a position to say actually when he's going to bring the bill back to the House? Um, I've indicated, um, Mr Speaker, there in response to, to that question, that I think it would be good for the general public to be aware of the contents of, of the particular package for Northern Ireland uh, for a whole range of reasons. That's an additional reason. Um, the, um, Information that was passed on by the uh, Finance Minister is information that's been in the public domain for some time. Um, the Prime Minister has spoken about it, the Secretary of State has spoken about it, other Westminster uh, ministers um, from DWP have spoken about this, and from the Treasury. So there is a concern there that over a period of time you get into a difficult position there in terms of potential penalties. But this is not a matter that is just for me, this is a matter for the entire executive. And therefore, I believe it is right and proper that as soon as possible we get this into the executive and get it out in there, into the public domain and into the assembly for further discussion. Um, but it's something that is a matter for the entire executive, and particularly OFM, DFM, as well as myself. I call John McAllister for a supplementary. Um, thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I'm grateful to the Minister for his reply. But given that this is now only about three months until January 2014, we do not. I think it's important that the confusion ends as, uh, out there, as the Minister outlined in his earlier answer, and is absolutely imperative. Does he agree with me that it is time his executive colleagues um, 
uh, with him pressing on this, they'd actually uh, grabbed the bull by the horns and made a decision on this before uh, we simply run out of money. Um, I have in the past commented on the potential difficulty in terms of penalties. Um, I was in this chamber accused of scaremongering by a member of another party. Um, I think the, the point was made yesterday this wasn't scaremongering. This is a real potential difficulty that is coming down the track. But apart from the penalty issue, there are all those practical, sensible reasons for moving forward on this, and they're the ones I've already outlined. I call Peter Weir. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And as the question I'll be asking relates to an announcement yesterday, if it does appear later on the agenda, there's clearly been a bit of insider trading. Uh, can I ask the Minister for his reaction to the announcement by the Finance Minister yesterday of £5 million uh, for co ownership housing? Um, yes, indeed, I do. I, I welcome the additional £5 million for, for co ownership housing. I bid for £10 million, but uh, in the spirit of generosity, I did get £5 million out of the, the, the Finance Minister, uh, and I welcome that. Um, there is uh, a real benefit from co ownership housing. It has been extremely successful in the past, and I think it is a welcome uh, investment in that particular way of bringing more people into home ownership, providing affordable housing, and also it is of great benefit, I think, for the construction sector. Um, it has been in the recent past and will continue to be important for them. I call Peter Weir for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for his response. Um, I suppose to get a bit of a snapshot of where we are in terms of the co-ownership situation, can I ask the Minister how many co-ownership um, homes have been provided since the Minister came into office? Um, in the first year, 2011-2012, um, it was a figure of just over 500 um, homes were purchased through co-ownership. Um, in the second year, 2012-2013, um, um, it was around 950 homes were, were uh, purchased through co-ownership. I'm glad to say this year we're actually well ahead of our target. Um, the target was 500 homes in 2013-14, and we're in line with those expectations. Already we've delivered beyond that 500 by providing 540 uh, homes delivered, and there's approximately 650 more are in the process uh, of applications being dealt with at the moment, so well on target. In fact, well beyond it. I call Michelle McElveen. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And in light of this morning's news that the construction sector appears to be taking the, the first steps out of a period of recession which basically brought it to its knees, can I ask the Minister what efforts his department has made to maximise opportunities with that sector? Um, as the member does, I too welcome the news this morning uh, in relation to the Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors um, survey, which said that the, the construction sector is exiting, in fact has exited, uh, recession. So that's a, a good piece of news. Uh, a rise in workloads has been reported for the first time in five years. Uh, and just to, to, to address what, what, from my own perspective, DSD has been doing in that regard, we have talked there already about co-ownership, but we provided over £228 million in 2011, 12 and 12, 13, and that resulted in the building of 2,800 social homes and also uh, provided over uh, 80, £83 million this year with a target to start 1,275 social homes. But the social building aspect of the department's work is only part of the picture. You also need to look there in terms of uh, the construction sector gaining through um, public realm schemes and neighbourhood renewal work. And over the past couple of years, around £50 million each year has gone into uh, physical development schemes and about £50 million as well and a little bit more into neighbourhood renewal schemes. So all of those, whether it be the social housing sector, the co-ownership, the um, physical work, public realm work and so on, neighbourhood renewal, all these have certainly been of great help to the um, construction sector and have contributed to some degree in that good news this morning that they have exited the session. And that ends our period of topical questions and we move on now to oral